Thank you. And uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, I'll just let you know once the recording starts. Uh, yeah, it has started now. Over to you, Satya. And uh, can see my screen, Rakit, and everyone. Yeah. Just I'll making wait. sure you are seeing the right screen. Yeah, we are seeing the slide. Okay. Session perfect. number five. Session number five. Thank you very much. Good confirmation. OK, welcome everyone to Microsoft Dynamics 365 platform convergence. So today we are in session five. And uh, we will be talking about data integrator and logic apps and our speakers are Prinka Garg from PwC and uh, Mohammed Mustaja from uh, Karachi System Limited. That's the name uh, Mohammed System Limited. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right. You said it right. Thank you. Right, so before we get into the session today, there's a quick disclaimer from our group. Uh, I know you must be hearing this kind of a disclaimer nowadays because every sessions are virtual and every sessions are being recorded. So uh, I believe nothing new uh, for you guys. So today, all the views expressed from the speakers are their own personal views coming from their own personal experience uh, and uh, don't try to link it to their employers or from Microsoft. All the environments which everyone is using are trial environments, not nobody using the environments from any of the client. Again, session will be recorded and uh, this will be posted sometime on YouTube also. So if you don't want to be part of the recorded sessions, uh, you can exit now, even if you don't want you to exit, because uh, now we, <laughs> we want everyone to be part of this uh, session and uh, listen from the experts. Uh, I don't know you have, must you have observed or not. These sessions are a joint effort or a collaboration of three user groups and most of you are part of any of the user group i am pretty much sure and if you are not uh, find the link in the chat here uh, rajit or umesh will put the links to these groups uh, these groups uh, exist in linkedin exist on youtube exist on other social platform also so just keep uh, abreast of all the sessions coming up from these user groups so these groups are basically Australia, New Zealand, uh, D3C FinOps team group. This is purely for FinOps. Another one is uh, Use India, which is uh, a comparatively new group. And uh, Rajit was the founding member of that group. And the Pakistan user group, which had a very uh, large event uh, two, three months back. OK. And uh, here you can see all the beautiful faces from all the speakers in the past four sessions and uh, speakers from today, Mohammed Mustaja and uh, Prinka Garg. So I will spend some time next two, three minutes in talking about uh, basically the recap of all previous four sessions. So you know what journey we have done so far, how much we have traveled and what are we covering today. So today will be the last session and we'll be concluding um, this uh, discussion this big discussion about data words and all these uh, ecosystem of data words and integration scenarios all right so session one we started with the uh, platform convergence in uh, in general and about data words which was also a kind of foundation stone for this series and uh, Preeti Singh from Velrada, Rachid Garg from uh, PwC talk about uh, like significance of data words. Preeti also demonstrated how to create tables, different kind of data types, model driven apps in data words. And that was a, like a really good, good founding uh, foundation stone for this uh, whole series. And uh, people learned a lot. I personally learned a lot from that session. I'm very much new to data words. So that was really a good start for everyone. Then we had session two. Session two was uh, 
with Tim Shaw from Microsoft, Fraser and Rajit. Fortunately, we have uh, these people in all the sessions. Uh, so that was again a very, very fantastic session. Uh, Tim Shaw talked about the common principles and roadmap of Dataverse and how the user interface is unifying, like how the Microsoft is working hard to make it, give a uniform experience on the Dataverse. And Rajit had again a very good demonstration. That's again my personal favorite because I am from FNO background. So what he demonstrated was uh, how to embed Power Apps in finance and operation, which was again a uh, kind of eye opener for me. And then Fazel, uh, again we have Fazel every time. He's a master of uh, case studies. So whenever you want to uh, learn about uh, some case studies, some his uh, nuggets from his experience and we always invite him. So he talked about some key learnings and uh, again, my personal favorite was what you need to be an architect in future, right? So solution architects uh, in past were different, like your skill set requirement was different, but in future what's changing and what else you need to know to be a solution architect. Right, and uh, third session we had with uh, Cameron and uh, Rachid Gag again, and we talk about the business events. The business events, again, people who are from finance and operation background, ERP background, they know about business events, they exist in the system since long. Uh, but what special was in this session was how to integrate business events with Dataverse, and how this Dataverse will be kind of centralized placeholder for all the business events uh, of FNO in future. Right, and uh, we also talk about uh, uh, so what was the highlight of this session was from Cameron, uh, where on one slide he talked about all the business scenarios which can be covered using all these integration uh, techniques. So business events, dual right, virtual entities, data integrated, and logic app. So I took a snip, uh, snippet of that uh, slide, particular slide, and. Uh, Saved it for myself. I was also posted on LinkedIn if you want to see. But anyway, these sessions are all recorded and on YouTube if you want to go and uh, check that. So th that was again a very good session um, to cover all kind of uh, integration tools and when to use what what particular tool. So thank you very much, uh, Cameron and Rajit, for this fantastic session. Then last week we talk about uh, uh, dual right and virtual entities with uh, Amna Khan and uh, Fajal Freed. Uh, dual right virtual entities. Uh, I know many people must have seen it where people who uh, work on finance and operation and uh, CE CRM, they are very much aware about dual right and. Then again, from Fajal Farid, we um, got some insight about some case studies and his experience and what is possible in future using that dual right and uh, virtual entities. So today we are on the last uh, uh, day or the last episode of this series. And our presenter will be uh, Mohammad Mustaja and uh, Prinka Garg. So before um i hand over to mohammed if you have any question now you can ask or i hand over to mohammed mohammed over to you and please uh, when you are done I hand over to prinka so we'll be having session between prinka and uh, uh, mohammed for next one hour first session will be with prinka 30 minutes 30 minutes will be with mohammed and then next Last 15 minutes will reserve for question and answer. And feel free to put your question in the chat. Our expert team, Rajit Fajal, will try to answer it on real time basis. So definitely in the end, we'll have some time to answer it. Over to you, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Satya. Thank you, Satya. Uh, good, morning. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Wherever, Wherever you are, I know I the know. community I is joining, joining us from joining us all. various time zones. And really appreciate everyone who took their time over their weekend and joined us. 
My name is Mohammed Mustajab, and uh, I've been working in specifically CRM domain for around you know 11 years now, uh, with the Power Platform relatively new and uh, learning and experience in power automation and uh, Azure Logic Apps from past at least two years. So this is uh, a brief intro about myself, and I love to read uh, about AI and automation among business and love to see football in my free time. So over to you, Priyanka. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I'm going to share my screens if that's OK. Yeah, go ahead. Guys, can you see my screen yet? Yep, yeah, Pinka, all good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much for the, all the committee members uh, for giving us that opportunity. Um, as you know, my name is Priyanka Garg, but I like to be called Priya, short and sweet. I'm working in currently PwC Australia. I have um, 11 years of experience in Microsoft technology. Started my career as in beginning as a web developer or a programmer, but after just a couple of years, I moved my career to Techno Functional, where I introduced from Microsoft Dynamics 365 CRM, not even 365 CRM 2011, I would say. And as the product is evolving, I'm learning with the product, and here I am. In my free time, uh, I love to uh, solve puzzles. I love traveling, but I also love Toastmaster. Toastmaster is, a, is a, another community group where it's most focused on public speaking. I am been volunteering from last three years in a row in a Sydney, and I love being going there. It's just like a, going getting a positive vibes. That's about my introduction. Let's jump into our sessions today. Today, I'll be talking about the data integrator. And uh, uh, we will talk about today uh, what is what the agenda about data integrator today is uh, understanding of the data integrator. Then we will briefly discuss about the case studies and the scenarios uh, about uh, how we can do that. And then we briefly jump into the demo where I'll show you quick how to create, how to get started with the data integrator, how to create a simple projects and how to resolve some of the errors. And the last one, it would be some possibilities and limitation with the data integrator. What is the data integrator? And as you have seen uh, in the in these series, there are four previous sessions, there are multiple ways to do the integration between the systems and particularly finance and operations and CRM. So there are multiple ways and why we need data integrated and which scenario it would be good to use um, dual write or data integrator or any other things. Uh, I, I will discuss a specific case study that I experienced in the past and which will uh, I'll explain later. So let's talk about the data integrator. What is data integrator? It sits in Power Platform. It is actually point to point integration between data words and finance and operations. So uh, if I talk about the connections, we initially it comes with Microsoft uh, Microsoft Dynamics 365 for sales. Now it can be also integrated with data words. It means we could use all the out of box entities or tables um, to integrate between those two systems. Plus we can create custom templates too. So Microsoft sometimes Microsoft has provided some out of the box templates, but in my recent projects, I actually try to use custom templates because of the project's requirement or the scenarios that can't be fulfilled by out of the box out of the box scenarios. So what happened in the platform? So there are some templates that's given by Microsoft, or we can create custom templates, and those templates and connection sets becomes a project. That project is uh, depends on in one organization and in one tenant we could have multiple organizations like in our normal SDLC we talk about our dev sit UAT or prod so all these projects sit in a single power platform admin center and then last is the execution execution where we run the project we check the execution history we check what are the, what is happening there so in the demo I'll show you what are actually uh, how the execution works looks like 
Um, case study. Uh, I will talk about prospect to case cash scenario, and I believe most of you are very familiar with what is that scenario is. It's purely we are talking about uh, sales uh, from CRM and finance operations. It's purely a cash prospect to cash scenario where um, we do have in CRM, uh, we do have accounts and contacts. There are two different tables. But in finance operations, we have customers and contact. Um, it's by look at the name, it's look like simple, like yeah, one to one mapping. But if you look at the arrow there, um, accounts and contacts are actually going to the customer table. So what is happening is we have two types of customer. Customers are organization type and customers are prospect, uh, sorry, individuals. So in ERP, both the customers store in the same table called customer, but in CRM, it actually stores in a different table called accounts and contacts. And that's one of the reason in my previous project, we ended up uh, from door right to um, data indicator. Um, uh, this what was happening is um, we started with the project uh, with the door right, and uh, during that dev part, everything is tested, everything is unit tested, everything is working in door right. No problem with that. It it is a great tool, and it it provides the real time synchronization. But what happened is when we moved to SIT, then we finalized because the, it, it was a huge project and there were multiple vendors involved. And the customers are created by batch processing in ERP. So if it is created by batch processing in ERP, what happened is if dual right, uh, as we know, account or contact has a circular reference between them. And uh, if it is uh, if the records were created from the single transaction it is coming from the third party system and it was it was coming into the erp and then at the same time because of the dual right real time synchronization it was trying to create both the records in the single transaction in crm that's not possible because it has a circular reference to each other it can't be created as a single transaction it has to be created into multiple transactions now this scenario is not common to all the organization or all the clients i would say it depends on the uh, project you are working on, it depends on the requirement you are working on. So that particular project have those kind of requirement and we couldn't move from single to uh, uh, multiple transactions to just create the customers. Similar, uh, similar uh, uh, the roadblock was for us, the products, because products are every day or every other day they're coming from the different system and products are not like one or two, it's coming in a batch, like thousands. And we couldn't do and the third broad block was sales orders and this was also it's not if i'm creating from erp at one by one it is simple because it will be coming into multiple transaction and dual right will be processed very fine but um again it was coming as a single transaction as you know in crm if we create a sales order header uh, already invoiced and after that if we pass the sales order lines, it won't work. So we have to we have to keep it the sales order open to process the lines and after that we need to update the header to invoice. So those kind of three scenarios that we hit that we can't work with dual right and we need to move to the data integrator. What what else data integrator actually provide? Why how we resolve the problem? First thing data integrator can be scheduled and we can actually break up those tasks into a multiple transaction and we can uh, so that we remove the reference requirements from there from the projects so it's like i'm um, first time thinking the contacts then i'm thinking the customers and it's happening overnight so the system is not on load because the high volume of data is coming on the real time it's it's, it's a lot onto the system, lot of pressure on the system so <coughs> Excuse me. So these are the three reasons that uh, we moved to the data integrator and now uh, the our project is successfully running. And uh, because of because we moved from dual right to data integrator, um, if you know that in dual right, we already have created lots of tables from the dual right to already CRM. So those tables already exist in the CRM. Those fields are already exist in CRM, right? So in dual, 
in data integrator, we actually created custom templates to utilize those tables from dual right, to utilize those um, custom mappings from the dual right. I'm going to show in the demo how I utilize and I'll, uh, how we can actually use all the dual right solution tables in the data integrator and we can uh, evaluate. I, I think we can use those power of those tables without creating or without creating manually all these fields because these are tables are hundreds of tables or hundreds of fields. So without manually creating, we can utilize the system. Move to the demonstration. This is the just screenshot of a data integrator, how it looks like. Um, these projects like a simple graph and these are the projects in the system. I'm going to switch to my different screen. OK. As I mentioned before, uh, data integrator sits within the Power Platform Admin Center. Um, if we just go to admin.powerplatform.microsoft.com, we will be go to that screen. And from the left hand side, we can actually go to data integration and this screen will be open. Hey, in the screen, we can see that this is the graph and these are my projects. Uh, before doing starting anything, we need to create the connection. So for the first step to create any project in the system is to create connections. So what I did is if I'm creating a new connection set, um, it actually says that uh, we only can use right now Microsoft Dataverse legacy. So right now we uh, the connections are uh, connectors that is supported by Microsoft is legacy connector or the deprecated one. But it is highly recommended to use the legacy one instead of the deprecated one. So what I did is I went to uh, make.powerapps.com and oops. So when you go to the make.powerapps.com on the left hand side, if you remember in our first session, there's the dataverse and tables and everything. One of the link is connections. So here we can actually create a new connection. So if I go to the new connection, I'll look for dataverse. So there are two connectors. So currently data integrator is already supported by the legacy one, not this one. So if I go and click this one, it will ask me to create a new connector. If I go ahead and create, confirmed my um, account. So it has been created a new one. As previously it was created, it also created a new one. So we can create multiple with the multiple user. Similar way, if I want to create for the finance and operation, so I will go search for finance and operation. So this is the connector. This can be used again. May, a reminder, these connectors are premium. If you have a proper license only, then you only can you can use the connector. Otherwise, these connectors are not available to the organization. So the same procedure I'll not create because we already have the connectors. Once we have already the connections there, then I'll go back to there and create a new connection set. So maybe this time I'm going to give our SIT connection name. Then first party app. So I'll use my one of the connections. So first step connection and environment. So this is the environment URL. Second is my finance and operations. Then I need to choose the environment. Once I choose the environment, so it will ask me for the organization. What I did is because I was mentioning in my case study that uh, I went from dual right to uh, data integrator. Uh, usually here we either choose the organization in the finance and operation, we choose the legal entity and here we choose the root business unit. Because my data is already integrated initially with the uh, via dual right, the legal entity already created multiple business unit in, in my CRM. So I do have all the business unit here created with the same name as legal entity. So for the purpose uh, today we are using USMF, here we go. This is my business unit in Dataverse, and this is my legal entity in finance and operations. Save. Now, if I go to the connection set, there are two connections that previously I created as a dev, second I created as a SIT. 
connection. Two connection has been created. Now, after connection has been set up completely, my next step would be create a new project. Uh, for the demo purposes, I have created three projects. First, I'll discuss with this one, then I'll quickly show uh, how to create a new project. My in my previous uh, project or my case study, how we divided the projects is one is reference data, second is master data, and then is transactional data. The reason why is because we want to remove the dependency. Let's say if I want to talk about customer groups or payment terms or payment day schedules, all these tables are used in our master data. If I don't have customer groups defined, I cannot sync the customers. So I really need to first sync the reference data. So all these reference data should be in the reference projects. And for, for the demo purposes, I just created only two, but there is a complete list of the tables you can get from the Microsoft Docs. What are the different tables you can sync in the prospect to cash, uh, cash um, projects? Then after the reference data, I will go to the master data. Master data is example is if I want to do the products like uh, or warehouses or or my sorry warehouses should be reference and uh, my customers. So customers would also go there and I will set up my customers there. And the last would be the transactional. I could have combined transactional or master because unless I have the master data uh, set up completely, all the customers set up completely, I couldn't go to the sales order lines or invoices. So that's my sales order header or sales order lines. After that, I can could go to the enhance that project and go to invoice invoice lines. Uh, there is no hard and fast rule how you should uh, define those projects, but there is a limitation that how many projects you can define in your paid license, paid environment as well as in tri your trial environment. So just to keep the performance uh, OK or high and just to remove those confusion, where is my project is just good to give a proper naming convention. Now, if you see the lattice sync over here in, in this example, I have all three status over here. This was says it's two, two hours ago. This was has 44 minutes ago, but it's showing the red error means this project has some errors and that we need to look at after it. And the third one is says never. So this was just created there, but it was never sync between the system. And the next one says next sync is not scheduled. So it means these are synced as an ad hoc. There is no next scheduling has been uh, set up. It means we have the option if I want to go to the project here. I can actually schedule this project uh, that I really want to do day and after every one day and it starts on today and instead of 3 p.m. I might go 9 p.m. So that it's purely off hours. It's not working on this uh, peak time where the users are actually using the system. If I want to define end date, I could. And I can actually set up the notification where actually I can provide my email that whenever something goes wrong, I should get a notification there and I can do the save schedule. I see one of the questions there. What are the limitations? I'll go after the demo. What are the limitations there? Um, Back to reference data, it says now in five hours because I have set up the scheduling there. Now, um, how to create a project and how to create a task. So there is a small, uh, there's a button on the top where you say new project. We need to define the project name. So maybe I'll just go reference data version one. I can choose the connection that I have created previously. Now, here is the option to choose the template. These are the out of the box template that comes with this connector that we chose the legacy connector. If we have choose some other connectors, there are multiple. Um, there are there might be more templates or in the future, Microsoft uh, must be releasing more templates. Now, in this demo, I'm using FinOp Finance and Operations to CDS. Now this what happened is whenever I create a task, it will go only only one directional. It, uh, it is not a bi-directional like to your right. It will only 
pass the data or integrate the data from ERP to the CDS. But if I'm using this template, but if I'm using this template, CDS to finance and operations, so it will integrate the data from CDS to finance and operations. So if I need to, if I have my my requirement is bi-directional, I actually need to do both ways. So I need to use both the projects uh, separately, not in single one. So if I'm using this one, organizations. So remember, we have set up those organizations when we define the connection set. I can use this one and then create. <laughs> So I just created a version one. So this is how we create the projects. But right now, when I open this project, it is brand new. It's empty. And now if next task is to add a task. Task means we are actually defining how to create a project. Oh, sorry, how to create those tasks by defining those table names. I'll not go in those more details, um, but a very simple task name just. I'm talking about products here. Table name is products. Still loading. So I can choose the product one or just let's go product styles for now. And now I'm using the product style table. This product style is not a it's a standard table or standard entity in ERP, but not in CRM. So why this table is already existing in my CRM environment is just because um install that you'll write it product table oops I don't have the actual table name there you go styles oh god I have this one at the last Finance operation is style, and in that hour, it's a product style. Product style is a custom entity. It is installed due to the dual right solution over there. Now I need to choose the organization and save. Now this will go from CDS to finance and operations. Going back to our existing um, products, once we have all the projects has been set up, now I want to move to, uh, I have tested in dev, now I want to move to SIT, what I should do. So in that sense, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and save as a template. So there is save as template. I can give version to the template or version number over here, provide the description, contains customer details, so that I know what I'm talking about. Now there is an option that the template can be shared with everyone in the organization so that anybody have the access to Power Platform Admin Center, they can use. Again, uh, when I say how access, so we need to get the access Power Platform Administrator access uh, through Microsoft Office. So I get save. Oh, the project is not created. The I get an error that template was not created because project is invalid state. It means that project has some error and I can't create a template. So first I need to go and fix those error before actually try to create as a template. And this is the, uh, actually I wanted to show you. It says project has a warning and we don't know which project has a warning. So I know it's a big task. If we have like 10 to 12 tasks in that, we need to go one by one and open that which task is actually giving a problem. So not this one. And I said not this one. So it says it is actually missing the company code or company schema. So what does that mean? This added is really important because I am um, configuring the US MF company, that is my legal entity, and in D365, it is uh, also a table plus the uh, root. So I'll do go add mapping. I'll add, this is how you do the mapping between the fields. And I'll go company code. Um, company and I'll provide 
So if it is a direct mapping like credit limit, it will just have an equal to sign without a, because the values will go from source to destination without without transformation. But if there is the transformation, there is a sign of FN where we are actually doing the transformation. For example, of this one, it says uh, default value is true. In this case, we have actually provided the default value to one. And maybe I'll go back there. And reference data. Yeah, so this value is. Transform type is instead of default, I'm using value map and because this is the Boolean field, yes and no value. So in ERP, we have no and yes value, but in CRM it's false and true. So sometimes uh, in ERP, we have the NM field and NM field has to be go with option set uh, mapping. So this time also we will use the value map. If we want to see the JSON there, we can see how it looks like. And this is the way we can add more mapping over there. If we are not using, we'll go back and cancel. OK, uh, this is uh, about the projects and we talk about the task. We talk about the connections that we are using. Scheduling we have checked. Now the last thing is execution history. Um, this is. Uh, if you see this one, um, everything is has an error. It means I tried multiple times and it is not working and we need to fix that error. Um, what is happening over here is in this one, their error might be different because it was just all failed error. When I go into the deep dive, I can actually see how many errors are there and what is the actual error there. So. And another example is. I provided the uh, this time I have two maps and this is when it's a success, I can't drill down. But if there is an error, actually I can drill down again and see what is the error message. And that says it couldn't resolve the grid ID. So I need to make sure that that field actually exists in the CRM before I move that reference there. Uh, one option to remove that uh, reference is either I need to remove the reference from the task or I need to make sure really that these fields, uh, these field or this particular record, it actually exists in CRM. Oops. How we can quickly check if it exists in the CRM or no. There is a hyperlink there. And we can actually say now it's 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 calling the auto data service. It actually said that this value doesn't record. If the value is coming as empty, it means this record doesn't exist. We need to get that record uh, first created in CRM before actually we can uh, create the customer groups in C uh, CRM, or we can migrate the customer groups from ERP to CRM. Okay. Um, connection set. I really one thing I want to one more thing I want to show you here. So when I'm within the project, there is the connection there. Sometimes I get the error of that missing integration key and how to resolve that integration um, key uh, error is you need to go to the connection, go to the connection set details. Here you need to see, yeah, I'm. Uh, you can verify that I'm connecting to the correct organization. Then here's the integration key. Based on the connection connection set which you are using, and based on the tables that you are syncing, here all the tables uh, integration key is there. So sometimes we do have a requirement that we don't need this key, or sometimes we do have a combination of two keys. Let's say I really want to do the account number plus the email here so I can actually choose the field over here. Oh, sorry, the search function is not there here. So maybe I'll. Pick up a field email address one. So for me, for this account, if I want to sync the accounts, I can use account number and email address. And same way, if we really don't need uh, that, because if we are not using this vendor table or I don't need integration key, I can set, go above and select to none. And save. 
So my integration keys are um, saved over here. So if you need to change the integration key, this is the place based on the connection. Uh, so first you need to go to the project. Within the project, you need to go to the connections, then integration key, and here you can actually update this integration keys. Now, um, in the beginning in the case study, I was talking about the reference data, uh, the circular reference between accounts and contacts. So what I did is uh, it's my key learning. It's not in a working state yet, but uh, it'll give you a quick glimpse of how, uh, how I have set up the projects. Come on. Master data. Yeah, here we go. So in this example, uh, there are five projects, but I'm using single two, single table, two tables only. The, in the first project, what I'm doing is I'm getting all the con uh, contacts from the V2 to contact table. So it is where the I, I remember that in finance and operations, we do also have the vendor contact. That's why I have actually filtered the query that I really want the contact that are associated with accounts, not with the vendors. So these are the query. So I need to pass that if I know the value. So this value I got from ERP and it's not defined by me. Second project I have set up is customer to account. So it's going from V3 to accounts in this one. I do have all the org type customer. So my party type is organization. All the org type customer should go to. Uh, maybe I'll just delete this one. All the party type organization should go to uh, from customer V3 table of finance operations to dataverse accounts. So that's my second one. Here I have not given the reference yet. And third is my party type individuals. That's also going to party type person or individual customers that are not related to any organizations that are actually going to the contacts, not to the accounts. Oops. Then we have reference to these one. So in this one, what I'll do is CDS contact with custom reference. So I already synced all the contacts. I already sync all the accounts. Now I'm just passing the customer reference in this page and in this last one, I'm passing the contact ID to the customer so that they can complete the reference. They can complete the loop. Otherwise, uh, it is uh, it will be again going to end up in if I define those customer reference in this one or contact reference in this one, it will again end up in a circular reference that we were trying to solve in previous one because now I can schedule this as a nightly or fortnightly or two times a day, whatever our volume says or whatever the project says. But based on the data, based on the requirement, I have set up these ones and it will resolve my uh, circular reference of the contacts and accounts is from CRM to customers. OK, um, going back to my slides. That was my end of my quick demo. These are the some possibilities and limitations on uh, what we're talking about, how we can leverage the dual write integration. And uh, first thing is it is one directional. I think somebody asked the question in chat. I have not looked at very much, but so many questions, but uh, just to recap on that, it is one directional. It only uh, at, uh, it only transfer the data from source to this uh, destination. If we need to set as a bi-directional, we need to actually set up two different projects. But in dual right, we can have in one project. So we can only schedule 50 integration projects at a given time, but at a time means only it. I'm talking about scheduling here. We can set up 100 projects. It doesn't matter. But scheduling of those ones can be happen at a given time only for 50 projects. But for the trial environment, if there is an additional limit, that scheduling project would only run for first 50 executions. Now, execution means one project can run 10 times and other is running from 30 times. So we already covered the 40 executions. It means 10 executions is left only. So this is for the trial limit. And uh, now this is that 
uh, five projects per minute. So just to improve the performance, it is recommended that we can only run five projects per minute per tenant. If we are running more than five, the performance will be low and uh, it will be a lot of uh, pressure or a lot of uh, 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 lot of performance issues in the system. Uh, I think to optimize the performance and to not overload the apps, there's a limit of projects to 500k rows per execution per projects. Um, in my recent um, project, we had the data that we were loading um, in our test systems. Uh, even we here are using 300k or 400k, it was always failing. It always says task was cancelled or task was aborted. And when we went to the Microsoft and said, why it's happening? So because the sandbox environments has doesn't have uh, much infra behind that or the power behind that. But if you are talking about the production system, it should have and it should actually run 500k rows per execution per project smoothly. About execution history, remember I was showing you the errors history and everything. It is only maintained for 45 days. After that, uh, it is all, it is purged automatically. If we want to keep the prior history, we can export the history by right click and just go to export the project with history. It will uh, give us the history if we want to maintain that. But in the system at, at the user level, we can only see until 45 days. That's it. All right, that's to summarize. I think we do have a question and times after Muhammad's uh, uh, session. So I'll give back to you, Satya. Yeah, thank you very much, Prenka. That was really, really insightful session. Uh, we have some questions if uh, I think you answered one of them, uh, like limitations, um, like you covered everything in the last slide, I believe. There was a question from Dr. Ludwig about the 50 projects at a time. So you're saying 50 projects is not a limitation, it's more of the um, setting the batch is a limit, right? 50 projects can be scheduled at a time. Yes, but it can be scheduled at a time, but we could have more than 50 projects in the system. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And uh, I think you also covered it's a uh, one directional. If you wanted to make it work bi directional, you have to create one more project, right? Uh, like two, again, one way, but you have to create like two channel, two projects. <laughs> okay, thank you, Prinka. So we can take more questions. You can, uh, giving you more time to read through the questions. Uh, we'll invite you again to answer these questions. Now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mohammad Mustaja. Uh, so I, I might, might pronounce your name wrongly, Mohammad. <laughs> uh, hopefully I'm audible now. No problem in the listening, right? No, looks good. That's great. That's great. Yeah, it's Mustaja. Uh, you can say oh. Mustaja, but I was very no close. It, it's a it's a it's a tongue twister. I know. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. So okay, so, so over to you now. I'll not be Thank wasting you. much time. Thank, Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. So, uh, good day, everyone. I'll be sharing my screen. Firstly, the slides. Uh, please do let me know once you guys can see it. Can you guys see my screen? Is my screen visible? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. Thank you, Pranka. That was a really insightful session on data integrator and uh, I really like you know that how integration has become easier and easier uh, with with the passage of time I recall using the same data integrator a couple of I think an year back but there was still the same limitation and challenges there which you showed demonstrated that you know they are addressed like enum and all those stuff now so it's good that things are progressing and uh, similarly one of the integration that I will be talking today is Azure Logic Apps. So uh, now when we hear about Azure Logic App, like, let me just break down first of all the agenda, what I will be covering, like what is it about? The introduction about Azure Logic App, what is it, where we can use it, some of my experience around it, why I, I started using Azure Logic App when we have, you know, data integrator, when we have uh, uh, dual write, when we have even MS Flow, you know, you, you can use MS Flow for integration as well, even in any case. 
but so why we should go for Azure Logic app will be the part of my introduction. Then importantly, costing and licensing is, is something that it's ma mandatory that we cover. Reason being that uh, we have to understand the overall ecosystem for Azure that it works a slightly different way compared to the business apps or the data uh, to your right and other stuff. It's it's have its own sort of a consumption based or a pay as you guess. Which I will also cover also a case study, a demonstration, a scenario that uh, uh, because we are talking and I know a lot of FinOps people are there, so I would like to show them how I can link up things between FinOps and CRM as well. And obviously in the end, some takeaways and uh, question answer sessions. We like takeaways. Yeah. <laughs> Key <laughs> takeaways. Knowledge takeaways, nothing else. <laughs> Sorry. We, we can ask the organizers for the takeaways. So. <laughs> but uh, okay. So Azure Logic App is a, is a, is a software as a uh, service. If, if someone of you are not aware of it, uh, it's, it's just simply software as a service means that something you are purchasing as a software and you are using that. Uh, to enhance your business applications and stuff. All the biz apps are mostly SaaS based module. It's it's mostly integration use. I would not say it's it's just limited to integration use. It's it's something you can connect even uh, your uh, on premise system as well, or or you know you can link it to, for example, a case like uh, uh, run for on on a creation of an account record you have to create or trigger an SQL event, right? That can be a case. So this SQL is residing maybe on your own premise environment. If that's the case, it can be used to kick out that or kick start that, uh, you know, trigger as well. So integration is the main, uh, I would say, the reason behind it of using logic apps, but it can have multiple more, you know, some sentiment analysis it can do as well on a Twitter. You tweet about it, people. You can use as your cognitive services to consume those uh, uh, tweets and, you know, just try to extract out is it uh, sentiment as form, sentiment is negative, positive about a product. All these things can be done. Single tenant, multi tenant is important that I will demonstrate definitely once I progress and I will show you the pricing, how the single and multi-talent uh, is, is, is significant for the Azure Logic App. And the last part is the is the main reason behind, uh, if I would suggest or recommend, as Priyanka was saying, a really good thing that I really like about is that it's it's upon your call that they started using dual right in their project. But unfortunately, they found out that because of the load or, you know, maybe the uh, transaction per minute capacity or maybe uh, some other reasons, you know, dual right was not a fit suited. It's it's not about the product. It's not worthy. It's about the level of usage that we want to extract out of that product. It's important. That's why when we are planning or when we are thinking about an integration or when we're trying to purchase a product, the main thing that we have to keep in mind is that particular product is it fitted for me? It's just like wearing you 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 you're my you're, you're, you're a built up guy and you're wearing a medium t-shirt. It will fit, but it will not be super fitted for you. So that's the case. It's it's always the product that fits your use and addresses your problem. So that's the reason that you should come to Logic Apps when it's coming to B two B enterprise solution. Like you know, you you're having a million of transaction of orders per day. Then I would definitely not vouch or suggest even a, a dual ride or data integrator because they will have their own limitation in capacity and upper threshold levels. So that's the main reason the logic apps comes in, but it doesn't mean uh, you don't want to use it for other cases. Like maybe you can use it uh, for for lower cases or lower order rate, lower account synchronization as well. So uh, this is a brief ecosystem diagram that's available on Amazon as well. You can see right now that Azure Logic App is 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 not something you can say uh, just an integrator or a facilitator of an integrating between two systems and you know making sure that A data is coming from system A 
and B, its data is going to system B. Yes, that's that can be the sole purpose of it, but it can be used to initiate some triggering or mechanism as well. Or uh, maybe uh, you can see as your function here, and I know a lot of you, if you don't have an idea, as your function is more of a code based in uh, to triggering tool mechanism that you can use. So something you can perform an operation here, like as your function performs it fetch customer information. And the logic app can use that same information to kick out, uh, sorry, kickstart, uh, you know, a skill trigger. Even though it's it's not integrating them, it's not updating any values from it. It's just validating what the input is coming from Azure Functions, and it's just making sure that it it updates the or it it starts the process or trigger in the SQL level. So it can happen. Similarly, all the connectors that are normally that you can right now think of are either available as built in or uh, one thing that's bring to mention data connectors as well, data integrator as well that it can be uh, you know maybe premium connector or managed sub connectors which which the, is the word used here in the Azure numbers so, uh, Azure logic app so still if you're curious about you want to read more about it, how it, it this is a really good blog uh, from uh, when I used to start learning about it. You know, you can go here and learn about it more. It's really a good learning which explains you the about the whole Azure Logic app. Now, the main thing is is again the costing, right? Because when you think about Azure, it's pricing, it's costing, it's pretty much different compared to what we are used to when we are using Toolride, uh, MS Flow, or maybe the any other uh, data integrator. So the first thing is that Azure licensing is, is mostly in a simple way, is as pay as you go, like your executions are counted, your uh, per API call is counted, or maybe it's, it's how you, um, are running the whole system. So it's like if, if your function is ideal, ideal uh, sitting, doing nothing, it's it's nothing. You, you're not getting, you have don't have to pay the cost, but if that is residing on one of your virtual machines, then obviously you are to have to pay the virtual machines prices. So again, the Azure ecosystem is a bit different. And how do you do that? Why I brought it up? Because instead of jumping into them and demonstrating you the capability, I want to share some uh, you know how those Azure pricings are managed. So here is are the two uh, URLs if you want to learn more about it. One is about Azure pricing and Azure blob pricing because in the end, whatever you do, either you're performing any record operations, either you're performing any sort of uh, uh, data transactions, or even if you're trying to store your logs, you have to have some storage, right? So Azure blob is a really I uh, would say low cost, uh, no, like no code, low code, just a low cost uh, storing information area, which you can store your uh, information there. So before uh, going, and I will show you the URL as well, the hopefully Azure Logic Apps Pricing is divided in four main modules, which you see on the left hand side. And what are the key components? I will discuss on the right side. So the first point is the standard plan. The standard plan is is something that you know it's a single tenant bit. And as you recall in the introduction, I explained that there are single tenant base and there is a multi tenant base. So I'm demonstrating you a single tenant bit is if you are interested, it's a standard plan. It's instance based. Uh, it's tier based. Like you know, you you have to get the standard plan, uh, and I will show you as well in the URL in the costing URL just shortly. Bear with me, please. That you have to buy or get which CPU memory, which information you like, how much capacity or the system power you need to run this whole of your Azure Logic App. As I said, you know this this Azure Logic App. It's just not simple integration tool. It have many things to it. it it's a whole complete different world there. And uh, if if the data is if in a standard plan case, the data remains in your same region. Like you know, you cannot host or deploy it on maybe multiple regions. This is a concept in Azure that you can deploy your uh, information in multiple regions or your, your your logic app. So that just case of disaster recovery and all those stuff. 
consumption plan is more of a pay as you go. You consume, you pay, you consume, you pay. So it's more of a prepaid or maybe a postpaid sort of case, which it's just like our mobile. Uh, we, we use around uh, 1,000, uh, sorry, 100 Australian dollars in it. We have to pay just 90 because that current month we use 90. So it can be that way or it can be, uh, uh, you know, the standard plan in which you have to pay, uh, you know, a specific price. And it's again, as you see, built-in operations are there, operations. So my favorite or my area of that I feel most liked when I worked on is the consumption plan. I, I didn't get to be honest chance to work on the standard plan, but to be honest, there is only the pricing and the power difference in between these two plans. Then it's an integration environment. It can be a reason, you know, a lot of in organizations are reluctant or hesitant, you know, to 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 move their complete information on the cloud. So they, they prefer to do it, you know, maybe a secure or dedicated server or virtual machine that they can have. So it's it's more of an integration servicing environment that you can use. OK, and in this case is you you have the. Fully secure consumption plan that you can work on and we're not worrying about, you know, that it's being shared among multiple peoples. OK. Then it's an integration account. This is more of a uh, defining and it's mostly used for enterprise integration where you are managing it out um, or providing a business to business services to someone. Then this is the integration account that you have that you can use. The main key costing components on the right side, if you can see, are triggers and action operations, managed connectors, as uh, I think you saw in printer the session, or even if you're not, if you just go in and open MS Flow, you will see manage or you know paid connectors that that are mostly premium connectors in Logic App world. We, sorry, in MS Flow world, we say that it's 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 premium, but when it comes to Azure, it's managed connectors or it can be custom connectors as well. So these things are key costing components that will impact your integration, and along with that, storage obviously. Like if you want to store up a huge chunk of data, then obviously you have to go and you know just add that as such. So I'm just stopping this part. I have to show you one quick thing and be sharing my screen to. Sorry about that. I'm really sharing my screen to show you the URL parts. So do let me know if you can see the. OK, yep. OK, hopefully. I'm oh, sorry about that. OK, hopefully you guys can see my uh, other screen. It's it's the. Uh, the Mozilla URL, please let me know if you guys cannot see it. So this is the list of connectors. Uh, and if there is one important information that if you are implementing for. Non China and uh, US, they, there is a difference between when it comes to US and when it comes to China, you know, the cloud is separate. So you have to make sure that when you're choosing a connector, it's available there instead. You know, again, there are a lot of if and buts in it, but it's because it's it's the capacity and the power that you get after it. It's 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 something whatever you have seen before will be like like a wow moment for you. So you see over here that these are the connectors list. It's available on Microsoft. You don't need to remember or memorize it. It's you can just go in and search if this connector is available. What is the pricing and everything is general out there. Now coming here, this it was one of the URL that what if if you did get a chance to scan it was uh, was the the best URL where you can go and see the pricing, uh, how it works, and you can see right now in the standard plan the pricing is you know more of a CPU or memory base. As I said, that it have three tiers. That one is depending on these. All the three tiers are depending upon these CPU and memory. And I, how I can show you that I just switched to another URL in which pricing is. Uh, you know, sorry, it didn't load it. Just a second, let me go So the memory and pricing is is dependent for standard plans as per the uh, CPU and memory that you're using. If you're using 8 GB, it's it's like 0.0137. Maybe if you're using 16, it can be point uh, 
one, something like that. So it's this is the case that it can be uh, uh, cost here. So for example, I have to go in and set out the uh, logic app. I want to search this logic app. So look here, it's doing this, but it's really a good tool. You don't need to worry about uh, remembering all the calculations. It's just like you see over here, the regions is mentioned. I can go in and see Australia Central or Australia. I think Southeast is the area that we are all from, but and you see over here, the standard plan is giving us the option to choose one of the possibilities, which one we want to use. And depending upon you can see that you know the cores cpu and the ram are the critical one you can see that gg the storage space is more or less the same in the three tab but you can choose like okay 14 gb it can ask you what what how many instances or how many hours you want to run and you can do the calculation around it go have a look at it i won't go in much detail unfortunately due to time constraint but uh, if you have any questions around it please feel free to reach out uh, uh, over my Twitter or uh, my LinkedIn, and I will definitely try to answer these. But this is a pretty straightforward information that explains you how these individual uh, components or individual plans work for you. So now moving towards the other part, that is the Azure block. And it's its pricing is also mentioned here. You can see that it's, it's pretty reasonable you get 50 terabyte in in just you know the depending upon the module that you are going for like it's, it's hot premium or cool and you can see it's it's really reasonable obviously 100 terabyte and this data is relatively less if you compare for or if you go for a enterprise level organization but definitely it's something that uh, it's there and if you want to change the plan you can definitely do it so I wanted to give you a quick glance of this uh, along with that uh, a technical related like you know if you are trying to integrate your system to an API and all the stuff then you can use these the simple you know uh, calculation criteria and uh, you know to uh, learn it out how many sort of uh, instances you need or how many what will be the pricing around it. So these URLs I have already shared in my presentation. And it's it's really good for you to start on instead of jumping in directly into logic apps. Do these research first, get a report out of it, see it out. Is it as best suited for your company, or uh, if are you still needing it, or maybe the data integrator can help you out. So before log going into logic apps or any Azure service, the best part is to you know first of all evaluate it. How much do you think you need it, and for that. I just demonstrated that there are the tools are available. Then details are mentioned. You can just go in and you know just uh, start doing your calculation. So now uh, moving back again to my uh, presentation slide. Uh, sorry about that. Just a second. Quick uh, change of slide. So hopefully my slide is available and visible to everyone. So now. This was the pricing, and these are the URLs again in, in case if anyone is interested. I'm moving towards the ingredients. Okay. Uh, like all the great chefs, uh, we are also chefs and <laughs> we are software chefs, and we have to prepare some uh, ingredient before going into it. I, whenever I went to something, I always find it difficult. What are the prereqs to it? Like, okay, you know, I understand, yeah, this thing. A will do this thing B, but to do A, what are the prereqs or what are the ingredients that I have to have? So these are the basic ingredients that I will demonstrate uh, now in my demonstration part. Resource group, storage account, and type and design. That what are needed to start off with the logic app. The first is the resource group. Resource group is nothing. It's it's a logical or or, or container. It can be a container of all the logic apps in it. It can be a container of your all production logic apps. It can be a container of maybe you know your US regions logic app versus your Australia region logic app. So it's it's sort of a uh, you know grouping of of items together, and it's really good because once you scale, you consider from an enterprise perspective, and you're scaling your application. Uh, today is 10 logic apps, and tomorrow 500 logic app is 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 minimum. 
when it comes to enterprise solution implementation. So for that case, it's better that you start grouping out those resources together. So it's just like a concept of folders or you know your documents folders, your pictures that you have placed in a folder. So you can consider that resource group as a you know logical grouping of things as, that have a main or a common purpose that can be done. Still, storage account. Obviously, if you uh, in the start that I explained that you know your storage is important, you have to mention which storage account will be used so that at, according to that storage account, you can give and assign relatively information or policies around it or maybe spaces around it. And last important part is the consumption versus the standard plan. That is like which plan you should go for. Should you go for custom or built in or manage? All those systems are part of the logic apps ingredients. So this is the uh, to start off uh, preparing the um, logic app. You know, we have to know these three ingredients. And now I think it's time to OK, sorry to move towards the demonstration. But here is the first URL that you have to use the Azure portal URL that where we will have all the informations and uh, details where we'll be performing all these actions as well. So here, let's go to demonstration now. Let me show you my other screen as well again. Okay, so hopefully uh, my screen is available, uh, sorry, visible to everyone. And uh, here is it. So now, as I said, the first ingredient is always the resource group. And I'm here the, as per the, this is the URL. This is a simple URL. I remembered it and the one that I showed earlier in the QR code as well, portal.azure.com is the your go to place. And uh, if I go, whenever I log in, this is the main screen that I always see in Azure. And you know what? Azure have a lot of stuff happening. So a common con confusion comes in like, OK, where to start for? That's why I explained to you the ingredients of those uh, part, right? So first is the resource group. OK, the second is uh, the. Uh, oh, sorry, no, no worries. Let me go here to the Azure resource group and I can go and create it. Now when I create it. So OK, so you see over here, it's, it's just asking me the subscription. This is by default our subscription that we have uh, purchased as uh, you know as per the standard subscription that we have for azure we just name it okay like uh, logic app grouping and just explain the reason okay okay sorry uh, you don't have to use spaces uh, or i can say logic app fraud okay and i can group it as per the region like maybe us region and in our case it's like uh, south uh, Australia. I'm sorry if I'm selecting or not the Southeast is not right, but yeah, Southeast Australia. Review it and create it. So you know it's nothing complicated, but it's it's really significant. It's a small step, but with really greater significance when you are scaling up your application. So once you create it, it will create a resource group here. Simple as that. So if I go and create it, it will just take some time. And it always show you the pop ups and notification here. You know what? For example, some actions requires two hours, three hours. So you have to don't worry and monitor it. You can always see your alerts here and take an appropriate action. Now the other is the storage account part. Now if I go here and again click the create button. You will see it will ask me for the subscription and it will ask me to which resource group this storage account belongs to. That this storage account is for which store, uh, which resource group or so if I have to select just you know the uh, logic app production that I created I want to name it I will say you know storage account I can give it a reasonable name fraud and uh, okay sorry so every uh, area have its own um, sort of a uh, you know, uh, limitation that because the storage account fraud and stuff is you have to keep the naming convention that is mentioned there. So storage account uh, fraud, CC. Okay, so standard premium, which type of you want to use, you can use it. I 
won't go into much detail what these ideas are because main focus is towards logic and you can just review and create it that's it it's, it's nothing in that they all these tabs are if these are required if you want to specify which storage uh, will be assigned to it, all those stuff it's, it's it's a topic in its own for another day now coming towards the logic apps part okay so when i go back to my home screen let me just quickly close the other two here you see uh, there are two ways to do it. It's, it's first of all the logic app here, the uh, the global search. I will say you can search here, or you can go here and you know use this uh, categorization as well. This is one another way, or you can go and once you start using it out, mostly it's your favorites that you see at the top here, or maybe you know the recent resources. So it's it's pretty easy to navigate once you are used to it. So I will just go from here. I can see logic app. I'll just go here and select it. Now what I will do, I will just create add. OK, now what I said that these are the pre -DAC. you see over here. This is the first thing it's asking me, which which are your logic app. You want to use this app production because I didn't associate the storage account. I will just use the default one that we already have, but you can always select the resource group. And uh, after you select the resource group, you have the option to, you know what, standard or consumption, which is part that I earlier explained earlier that, you know, the consumption plan uh, is more of a pay as you go sort of a okay, and the standard is more of a deploying it on a dedicated machine where you will get a dedicated sort of a operational capacity uh, to work on. So this is it. Then I will just add the logical app name here. It's it's uh, what's the name of it? It will be like, you know, D365. Uh, OK, so I just to add that just review and create. OK, it takes some time. A uh, couple of things important here is is all these logic apps provide you with an endpoint. OK, and that endpoint can be consumed in API as well. Where where that when that's why when I was entering the name here, it was evaluating as well. So I'll just review and create it again. And. Uh, after a minute, um, sometimes it takes some time. It just validated it, it's initializing it. You see on the right side, it's mostly telling you all the action. It takes a minute or so when it creates a logic app, it deploy it. It's 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 in more of a not something we have to take an action on. It's more of a internal or Azure action that it's already performing at the back. So we don't need to worry about that. We just need to remember the key components that we need to start off with the logic app. So you see, this is here. So it mentioned that it's done. I will say just go to the resource. Now, when when I go to the resource, it automatically opened this screen in front of me, which is called the Auto Logic App Designer. A quick video if you want to go and learn about it. What is our Logic App? Some basic default common connectors are always available in front of you. Uh, I we will go with the blank Logic App first, but. If you see over here, there are templates available as well. In future, when you design your logic app, it can be used template as a template as well. So it's pretty straightforward that you know you by the look and feel of it, logic app maybe for the first time, all the people who are seeing it first time, maybe thinking, okay, man, this is something uh, you know, a black box for us. We don't know if it's it's too deep or if it's if it's too complex, but it's you can see right now with some practice. It's pretty straightforward. Only thing is that we have to remember how the pricing happens, how the pricing or do we need that logic app or not? So when I create to a new logic app button, you see it opened up on a screen front of me and those who have used MS Flow before would say that, you know what? It looks a lot like MS Flow. There is no difference in that. Correct, that's right. The only difference is that the backend power, the backend capabilities, the backend tracking options available with logic apps are much and I will demonstrate as well compared to MS Flow. So if I go here and I will just choose because I'm planning to integrate my CRM account to FinOps, I will just click uh, the Microsoft Dataverse. So if you're using CRM, always remember it's Dataverse, uh, which, which the CRM or customer engagement resides in. And you see over here, it's asking me for triggering points. I will say, you know what, when a row is added, and row is added meaning when a, when when a new record is added simple as that now you will see how 
simple it is getting now that you need to just click click visual designer is there and you are right now designing an enterprise level integration by the way go back five years back and think about an enterprise in, uh, integration it was just like okay you know what let's fold up our sleeves it will be a difficult ride so <laughs> now things are pretty much simple and you can see here that you know i will just go and select because i'm logged in it will and normally it asks about you know your login information i always say you know what this is my environment pick it up now as i said in a simple case i will just go and select account and uh, uh, just a second it takes some loading time maybe uh, sometimes it's internet and sometimes it's, it's azure so don't worry and it's the scope of the entity those who are crm uh, experience they are like you know the what's the scope of it is will we be using it on an organization level it will be our user level what this logic app will be running for so it's just like defining the scope of all this execution like everyone in the company will use it or it will be just the user one or two users that will use so you just defined it the organization you see here how simply we created a triggering point now i will add another time so that that is called scope and it's really important the scope is in 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 logic app it's just like your try and catch okay why it's important try that for example if you define a scope what will happen and i will show you here as well when i define the next scope that is you know what if my above action fails okay and is successful then perform this okay then i will say add a parallel branch meaning if an else condition you uh, please can see how smoothly we are just adding all those logics that we used to write in a code if and else if and else and all those stuff and you know it's pretty much so and i will say it will also configure after my try and not as successful but as failed so you see this is the try catch that I just added. So I will just rename it uh, try success. And uh, I will demonstrate it as well by creating a random error. Uh, try fail. So this is what I will do. If, if I try is successful, do this. If it's fa it fails, do this. So that's, let's do that now. Let's bring up the FinOps connectors. The area of interest, I know a lot of people are so what I need to do is I want to go in create record. And uh, I will just go in and select the instance. Okay, and I will just go in and select the entity. Name. And I think I really uh, remember one point Priyanka was mentioning that, you know what? The tables name are not the same. Like if it's account there, it can have not the account. So you do, honestly, it's customer in ERP and it's when when I was first time integrating it out uh, back a uh, uh, couple of months back, I was like trying to find you know account or customer. Where is it? Why can I not find it? Then I realized that you know the table name of ERP are a bit different compared to CRM. CRM account means account, and there is only one table around it. But in ERP, it's customer V3. That's the table that I will be seeing here in the customer. So it's a techie thing, uh, but. It's better that you you are aligned with the ERP person. That's what I will suggest, or you you have significant ERP knowledge to perform this section. Which that which table that you will be using here. So customer is there. I will add currency as USA, US, and I will add customer group. Okay, customer group. I know finance people are already aware of it. Okay, uh, this is this is really bad. So customer group is uh, something that I will just copy from here. I remember one value that was 30. Uh, and I will just go back here. So these are mandatory fields or values that we have to add. OK, and a couple of them, for example, if I don't add, it will give me definitely an error like organization name. OK, and customer So organization name. I will be just a second. Yeah, customer group. So I use 30, the retail customer. Uh, I won't go into the functional detail. I'm not super expert when it comes to finance, but yeah, customer group is something more of a grouping defined at the uh, uh, FinOps level that we have to use to create a particular account and customer. Sorry. 
So going back here, I will just organization. Now, one way is like I can add my name here. Thus, this will be a hard coded value, but organization name is what we say in CRM, the account name. Okay. And customer account is what we say in CRM, customer account number. Okay, so if I like, I want to intentionally remove that and see the try and success case. So that's why I'm not adding this value just to just to see it out how it's named. So okay, you say and currencies. I think uh, we I remember there was a currency USD. Sorry, yeah, this was USD. So this is that. Now let me save that. Okay, and uh, let me go back to my logic app again. One second, I recall one thing. I already have one logic app. Let me disable that. Sorry, I forgot to disable one of the logic. So else what will happen? It will try to create two customers on the same. Just give me a sec, please. So this is the one that we just created. So rest of them, I will be just disabling it. And it's it's really easy to go here, select them, and just go and disable and stop them. Okay, it will take a second or so. Only two were running, but it will take a second or so and it will disable them. So you want to check it out? Okay, so it's it's. it's Okay, stop now. Okay. okay. Meanwhile, it's stopping. I will go back. Here, this is my uh, logic app that we just designed, and I will just run it. Successfully check the trigger. These are stop. Yeah. So you see, these are two stop now, and I only have one enabled. So it's a quick way to check it out. Now, I will go back to my account. I will just go back in CRM and I will try to create one account here. Just a second, and I will just try to create account as a, a demo comp, um, uh, UG groups, and I will say in the account number 456. And just say save. Now, what will happen here if we go back into the um, Azure Logic app? You know, there is no run history. So you see, when I click run history, there is one that's running, and I know it will fail definitely because I didn't provide it one of the value. So you see over here, it gave me a fail issue. Now, if I go back, I know it will give me the error that you know the customer account or the it's it's mandatory in ERP that's missing. And you see over here that when the try fail. It went into the fail action and it, it went into the success action. So that's what I wanted to demonstrate if you want to perform any success or failure steps there. So let me go back and uh, just quickly. Uh, it's just a time check. Uh, sorry that I am aware of it. OK, so let me go back to the create record. Okay, I'm just uh, adding last part here, customer account, and I would hit add. Now, account number. Okay, now save that. Okay, and uh, go back to my account. Try to create a new one. Uh, uh, Okay, Australia. I just created. I will just add seven eight nine number six by four unique number, and I'll just save that. I'm going back to my logic app again. Think the history. Yep, it's running. Yep, it succeed. So I should find this particular person. I go back to FinOps here. If I go here, ah, okay, I know. So, just going back, sorry, I'm not good at FinOps, apologies. I uh, just, I'm still a learner. So, here, here you go. 
Oh no. So here you go. Australia account. It is in the system. So uh, I know this. It, it's 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 still. I'm just resharing my presentation again. Let's do share it out again. So key takeaways now here are. Firstly, it's the costing part that we should be aware of how that costing is because I would not say just go in and jump in and start, you know, recommend it. Low. You know what we need logic. We have data integrator. We have dual, right? We have MS flow. These are enough to address most of the cases. But if it's still not, then go for costing. Then and analyze your storages. And if you're still anxious what the storage is, curious how to do that, you can scan this QR code. Then go with the pre -dax. Use the basic pre -dax definition. If you plan after costing and storage, go for the pre -dax and start using logic apps. So I'm towards the end of the, my uh, presentation and uh, I will just thanking everyone for their time and maybe open for a Q&A session. Thank you very much, Muhammad. You are over time, but I didn't want to disturb you because Sorry, I could yeah. see the passion you are going through. I was like seeing a kid playing with this video game and is really not uh, <laughs> ready to stop. Thank you. But <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But like other um, gamers who play in the YouTube and other kids watching them, so we were also enjoying like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great to know. <laughs> No, so uh, yeah. I think now uh, because you owe time, there are two punishment for you. Okay. First is you have to answer all the questions. There are a lot of questions. Okay. That's and uh, second, we will be inviting you again because I think there are a lot to learn from you. Right, definitely. Rajit? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I will be more than happy to come back and back and share us. Okay, Rajit, you want to call out any particular question? Uh, yeah, have you yeah. from Muhammad. Uh, yeah, Muhammad, you can take a uh, stab at few questions, and if the oh, questions okay. remain unanswered, uh, we can respond to them after the session. Or if you, I will share my email address in the chat window. Um, just drop me a note, and I'll connect with Muhammad and Priyanka and try to get mm. them answered. I think couple one quick question, Ashik. Um, <laughs> Patel asked a real good question that, you know, uh, if MS flow, why use the logic app? The reason is, uh, you know, again, the load and the capacity or your usage. That's the main question we should ask. Like, can my work happen in using the MS flow? Good. That's perfect. But if the data increases, because when, when you're designing enterprise solution, it increases exponentially, then it's logic apps. And because you can see a lot of operations are there in the logic apps, a lot of Costing wise, it will be cheap compared to MS flow because MS flow is after some execution, it, it start billing you. That can be a reason uh, to go for logic apps. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So there was another question about multiplexing from Dr. Sure. Ludwig. Do Dr. we have any multiplexing? Okay, or do they, let's say for integration project operation data, would you ever use logic for that integration? Uh, well, uh, I will share my experience when when we use that. It's it was used for when we were implementing order to cash cycle from customer engagement to FinOps. And our orders were like maybe on a per day basis, thousand and plus orders. You know, the it, it the customer was a retail customer and it can increase. So that's one of the prime example. I will always say that go for logic apps, the pricing. Of logic apps really is is reasonable when it comes to the data load increasing. So I would recommend that on that. But if it's a you know 10, 15, or even 100 or 500 orders, then dual write data integration or even MS flow are significant enough to to handle your case. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, and I think the capability to integrate with the third party systems that also differentiate, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. Integrate with the first. Yep. I see two questions right now and um, a lot of them, but I definitely I will be answering as much as I can. But if you still have anyone have question, please drop it down to Rachel. Reprocess field record. Mr. Rab, there are 
Mr. Nath, there are two good questions from Dr. Dr. Lipsy. I can read to okay. with the yes, use of a, With the use of the integration account, is there a risk, risk of multiplexing? Have you seen how one might run into a multiplexing problems? And do you have tips on how to avoid, avoid that issue? So uh, if you run, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Honestly, ahead. yeah, I I didn't use the integration account in my uh, integration case, but that's a valid case. I can definitely do some research around it, but <clears throat> sorry, around it. If we can ha avoid that normally on paper and on as per the usage, it shouldn't come, but it can happen uh, this case in, in advanced stages, which I will have to go back and some do some research around it. Perfect. The second question I'll leave it to you. What I what that was actually about the, the calculator, the pricing calculator. The doctor did ask how uh, what I can find is translating the prices for data exchange in GB or terabyte into the actual records. How can I make a good and reliable price calculation? For example, for exchanging thousand thousand expense lines reports. Do mm -hmm. you have any tip how to make a good price calculation for that one? Trick. Okay, uh, the good trick is to firstly uh, go for your payload. Uh, when when I was uh, using the, uh, I think you if you didn't get a chance, I will share the URLs here as well. That first the, the first thing is that understand the payload size. That for example, you're using thousand line expense, or it's it's a medium payload. There is a dedicated website for Azure where you can define the payload and that payload break it down. The whole like, OK, you know what? This payload will have uh, approximately this much blobs and this much uh, blob accounts, all the stuff. So if you use that URL first, which is called the uh, Azure blob uh, calculation one, uh, I think it's this one. Yep, this one logic app Azure. I just mentioned it out here in the URL. This is the first one where you can do the analysis as per the load that you are having. And after once you are done with this load, and you are understanding it, then I would suggest to go to the pricing calculator and define what your uh, the URLs also shared, what the load and the information you got at the top and try to break it down as per the execution you may need to perform these actions. So these two websites I mostly use as well to define, OK, you know what? This is the load. This is the, uh, you know, the calculation that I can do and try to understand. But obviously it's it's not a Rule of thumb, I would say it's it's again uh, some more research and some more times. No, thank you. Thank you for answering these questions. There are a few more questions, I think, Satya. So uh, you we can take this one offline later on. Exactly. So yeah. We, yeah. We would like yeah. to take an opportunity to ask few questions to our talented and brilliant Priyanka. Uh, if someone wants to read out some questions about which were asked to Priyanka. I think so it's it has gone very up now. Yeah. <laughs> but I really I really like one example here, Priyanka, about uh, using data integrator over dual write. So that was actually uh, a two way because dual write always works in a one direct one in one transaction. But if you want to get back some response so dual write is not capable of doing that thing back, so you have to go back to the data integrators. So other than that, well, sorry, I'm just uh, behaving as a whole, uh, moderator here. So <laughs> reading some questions to all of you. Uh, if anyone has any question to Priyanka, please feel free to ask. I think one of the question I can't remember where it is, but it was like uh, where we can see if the uh, integration is failed or errors. I showed the error screen during my demo, but if you go need to see the export projects from the ERP side, you need to go to the data management and export the recent project and you get the project ID from the data integrator and you can match and filter those ones. So you, you can see what are the actual data that has been exported from ERP, but not synced to CRM. So it means it failed in between. And for that we can rerun the same execution so that we can actually uh, get all the records. Because what happened is when we have a change history enable and let's say 10,000 records has been exported from ERP, but it's not reached to CRM. Because of the change history, next run won't pick up. So we need to rerun the change history and find out actually what are the records failed, fix those errors and rerun instead of uh, 
running the whole um, project again. And guys, while, while we are doing this question answer session, if uh, people want to turn on their video, please go ahead. Want to take a capture? So also, uh, I would invite uh, Cameron. And uh, if Kim Show is in the call, like to say a few comments. Patrick, and Patrick, Patrick Short. Patrick, if you can Patrick, switch on Patrick, your camera, I would like to see your lovely face. I don't know about that one, but I'm here. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for joining. Hi, yeah, no, Tim, Tim's not here today. It's all good. Ah, thank you. Thank you for joining. A great session again today, everyone. Very good. Been uh, fantastic sessions that I've been able to watch. I missed the first one. Um, been watching the other sessions when I could. Um, so well done to everyone who's presented and well done to people turning up on the weekend. Absolutely, that, that's the best thing. People are so determined for their personal growth. Um, even on the weekend, we are spending like two hours from our family time. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank to... you for everyone that's contributed. I uh, yeah, wanted to just quick make one brief statement around um, I think the challenge that we have as professionals is using the right tool to do the job. And I've, I've sort of said this a number of times, but um, I, I, I did a demonstration recently where I combined customer voice, um, customer portal, uh, Dataverse and um, finance and operations in the one demonstration. Um, to, the, to the user, it looked like I was using one product, but by stitching those three things together or four or five things together in the right way, we can we can provide some very um, practical and powerful solutions. And our biggest challenge is when is the right time to use the right product. But I, I really want to thank all the guys that have shown us how we use these tools. And I think it's going to be these forums that help us understand the best way to use the product. So um, thanks for the opportunity of being involved um, Ratchet, it's been fantastic, and I just encourage everyone to continue to ask for um, guidance and help around what's the right way to, to, to bring these products together. So thank you very much. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Cameron. That was it. Okay. Uh, I, I personally would like to thank Rachid here because the way he has led the whole series, he was the one who took the initiative and asked uh, me uh, how we can actually include the rest of the user groups from other parts of the world, from Pakistan, from India, from Australia, from New Zealand. So covering the whole range of different parts of the world and then leading from the front. So heads up to you, mate. You have done a good job. And this is one of the best series that we have ever done from the convergence in the platform side. Uh, that this is one of the hottest topics going nowadays at, as Cameron uh, did mention, how the whole application is behaving same. Customer, actually it's hard to find a customer like uh, the, the moment we switch between financial operation to the customer engagement, to the customer insights, to finance insights, it's, it's coming along in a very beautiful way. And we all have demonstrated the real-time scenarios here. And it's very hard to find the real-time scenarios, case studies, and, and most importantly, support from our, our senior industry professionals like Cameron, Patrick, and, and Tim Shaw especially. And none other than Sunil Gar from Microsoft Corporate. So he is uh, inspiration for everyone, for us. But thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Fazal. Um, thanks, Fazal, yep. everyone, for the good words and the encouragement. I think this would not have been possible without the support of all the speakers and the volunteers who are working behind the scenes, and especially the guidance which we got from Sunil, Patrick, Tim, Cameron. Everyone has been giving us inputs on how we can make this experience better for the attendees. So, and that is one of the key things we were talking to our speakers that guys, let's make it more realistic. So let's not uh, make it a fancy uh, demo where everything is working. And that's where all the speakers have actually 
presented the real time challenges which we might face. So we have configured things from scratch. We have seen what errors we can get. We have seen how we can, you know, fine tune those scenarios and make it work. So I think all the speakers uh, deserve a big round of applause for coming, preparing and presenting with the community. So, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us and we will plan something soon, uh, maybe something, some other type of event, but uh, as I think Satya also mentioned, uh, festive season is coming uh, in India, Diwali is coming and Christmas is uh, on the list as well. So probably we'll be a bit uh, quiet for some time, but then we'll make a comeback. Uh, anyone else wants to unmute and say anything? Yeah. It's a much deserved break for you, Rachit, after this uh, really fantastic uh, five episode of five sessions and series. And it's I easy to say, like yeah, it's, it, it's easy to say, Rachit, and also it's easy to have you and your partner in the whole session so that no complaints. Like Satya is very happy today, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a big round of applause for Satya and Priyanka, yes. uh, our Satya dynamics Priyanka. family in the room. Dynamics yeah. family is in the room, yes. So no complaint. Uh, if you are getting late, no complaint. Both are getting late. Yeah. My kid is playing video games, so he's also happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your support. And, and Umesh, especially the guy from India, has done a lot of fantastic for, hard work for us. Uh, dealing with all the marketing, flyers, everything, uh, good work stuff, uh, mate. Thank you. We got joined by Shashikant uh, during the session. So Shashikant, welcome to the group. And he is also helping us a lot in driving these sessions forward. Thanks, Thank you to be part of the group. Cool. Anyone else want to say something or you want to take a screenshot, Satya, or you have already taken? Do I took want, multiple. Uh, uh, if okay. some new faces uh, comes up, I'll definitely take more. Okay. Cool. Wait, wait, just stay here. I think I miss Umesh. Maybe let's do it again. So if someone wants to turn on their cameras uh, to have a quick uh, screenshot, which we can share, then uh, please feel free to do. And uh, I have a lot of space in my Azure uh, stories. <laughs> We need a sponsor now. <laughs> okay. Done? I can show you. okay. Yeah. All good. Now we can move. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Over, thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone, and thank you so much again, everyone, for joining us. And see you soon. Great. Thank you. Thank so, you. Right. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye. Bye.